Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Um, the starting engine rebuild for 11.13 is about to commence. Now, in this video, I'll show you what was left of 11.13's original starting engine and some of the other potential candidates that may lend themselves to the build for this project. But um, So as you should know by now, starting engine will go right here, ties in with the diesel engine cooling system there and there, and has its own lubrication supply. Now technically, the starting engine does not have its own model designation. It was considered just another piece of the engine, no different than this oil filter or this water pump or this fuel filter tower, it was just another piece of the D3400. Um, and same goes for subsequent larger models as well. So you'll just find all the starting engine stuff in the D3400 book since it's technically just another piece of this engine. So spread out on the bench here is what is left of 1113's original starting engine. These things are extremely basic. They are a flat head design, twin cylinder opposed, and the way the crankshaft throws are on these things. <laughs> you would have two pistons that are going out in unison and then they come back together in unison and that caused horrendous crankcase pressure pulses on these things since you had two of those pistons coming in, squeezing the air in the crankcase and then pulsing back out again. Not really the smoothest running things in the world but they weren't really intended to be a long-term type engine. Um, I read somewhere one time, I don't have this in a publication, I read it somewhere, take it for what it's worth, but the intended service life of these starting engines was only around 250 hours. They were basically meant to be very basic, very easy to rebuild, and kind of disposable, if you can look at it that way. So. Right after we got 1113 home, uh, we tore this one down. This was off of the tractor when we first went and looked at it and found it. I'll put the link up right here. You can go and uh, remember how we found 1113. Uh, this had been taken off after the entire machine had frozen. This engine block was just about as devastated as, as the diesel was. You can see this piece right here just completely was heaved right out. And we'll spin this around. We have corresponding damage. On the other side, we've got this crack line that goes into the water jacket here, comes on out, disappears about there. But then you can see it comes down around here and then starts wrapping back up this back side. So this whole area was ready to, uh, to pop out as well. So that pretty much uh, ruins this block for me. It could probably maybe be repaired, but I have so many other candidates around here, it's not worth it for me to try and do that. But all the components that were on the inside of this look really good. All these crank journals mic out as standard and really not out of round at all. Um, pistons, the bearings were excellent. The wrist pin to bushing fit is excellent. No scuffing or scoring on these whatsoever. Barely had carbon on the top. And if you look in the light just right, you can still catch all the machining marks in those compression rings with your fingernail. I mean, no wear on the rings either. This was a really, really nice engine. It's just such a shame it froze. It just kills me. Um, has the original Eisman Mag on it, model RC2H. That makes me happy, another good thing. Still has the original Eisman Mag needle on and off switch. I mean, I don't know if it actually works, but it's nice and smooth. I have got them working by refreshing the contacts in the past. Um, like I said, everything else just really simple. Valves and guides and springs are all self-contained in one unit. Just kind of slide in there and a big uh, kind of a C-clip holds them in. Like I say, these things are so basic, there's just nothing to them. Um, everything else is looking pretty good here. Idler gear, front cover, I mean all this stuff. Just a shame that it had to freeze. But all hope is not lost. Let's get those two crates in here that I dug out of my storage shed in the last video. So let's get our first glimpse at the new recruits. Start with this uh, slightly smaller crate first. We'll see how things fared in storage down there. Yeah, you can see we got some we got some cobwebs in there. Been down there for a while, but uh, yeah, I was into this one. Oh my gosh, back when I was doing my five U uh, seven oh six six, the Iron Mistress. Um, I'm trying to remember, I, I believe I got just far enough into it to realize that the insides were actually pretty good. Um, we have the American Bosch mag on there. We have the mag switch, it's hooked up with, ah, those cobwebs in there. 
It's hooked up with a ground wire, so that tells me that switch must work. Otherwise, I wouldn't have went to the trouble of doing that. Mildly rebuilt carburetor on there, still in primer. We have a governor that I think got put on. It doesn't match, but it works. Um, this was just kind of a someday uh, stash for me here. So that is a candidate, which I'd probably end up getting back into and just making sure it's, it's as good as I can make it. So get into this bigger crate here. This one should be a rather complete one that was running. Yeah, I picked it up from a guy and I kind of forgot it had electric start on it. No, um, yeah, this one was running uh, when I bought it. So he had to build a little test stand for it with some coolant ran in there. Um, he'd been through it, had to make his own crank bearings. Um, I think he used some bronze in there, which I'd probably uh, be inclined to uh, go back in and see if I can get some uh, proper aluminum ones on there, but I don't know exactly what the condition is of this one for clearances, tolerances on the inside, but like I said, it did run. So it has the newer replacement Wyco mag on it. Um, this is set up for a later U-Series. It's got the U-Series fuel tank with air cleaner crossover, but it's got the complete carburetor on there, the uh, right, correct, and proper uh, Zenith. Yeah, he had had this... Uh, I think that's a lawnmower muffler he had put on there, but uh, yeah, we got this one right here, also a candidate. Moving on over here, inside these uh, heavy plastic totes, we have, this is a complete uh, torn down starting engine, block, top cover, pistons, everything in here. Complete unit off of an early RD4, and this one has some early oddities that are uh, kind of some first gen things that may fit in well with 1113. One thing I noticed about this, it's got the old Eisman thimble key switch on it. Treasure right there, man. That's pretty awesome in itself. Back here is another starting engine completely dismantled off of a D3400, I believe uh, 1945-ish, so it's a little bit newer than 1113. But like I said, it's got the complete block, top cover, heads, pistons, crank, everything. That's another complete engine. Um, this one right here, was this is kind of interesting this is a later replacement block it's got the 5f 9341 number with general cast into it and we have some replacing part numbers that are stenciled on the side here that this supersedes i've never seen one with general on there but like i say that 5f number that is quite newer um anything that would have been on 1113 would be the 4b666 you can see this is 919 of 38 casting code on that one but this, this is also a potential viable alternative right here. This one was not in bad shape at all. Um, it came off of a D2, and this was probably one of the nicest running, slowest idling starting engines I've ever seen in my life, but it had a rod knock. Trouble was, somebody had been inside this thing and put some new rod bearings in, and it was something like they had had the crank ground undersized, but they put standard bearing shells in, and it was excessive play but anyway contents of this crate are pretty much all of the internals i'll be danged another electric starter i forgot i had electric start on this one too but pretty much all the internals from that block there We've got some more good stuff yep there's the crank and some pistons and the cam and some other stuff down there so another someday stash just waiting to be utilized and if all else fails i've got this old junkie core i could take down too. I have no idea about this one. All I know is that it turns yet. We have quarter inch plus of crank in play, which is never good, but could be some decent pieces in that. Something else I've been saving for someday projects. We're getting into the super top secret stuff here. Open it up. Custom padded ammo can. Two freshly ground starting engine crankshafts in there. These are ones that I found in engines. Let's see if I can pull it out of the padding. There we go. Found in engines that were uh, good candidates for undersize. This one is uh, rods 20 under, mains 10 under. Had it ground, smeared everything with grease so that nothing would rust or corrode. Stored it away in the, uh, the special uh, padded ammo can for safekeeping. This other one in here is uh, rods are 20 under, mains are 20 under. So, we have those that I've just been uh, sitting on. May come into, uh, into play here shortly. And I should have 
the new undersized bearings on hand already to fit those crankshafts and even some bearing stuff that goes down to as far as 30 under in case I find a crank that needs to be taken down further than that. And um, also sitting on a pretty decent stockpile of new old stock valves, pistons, rings, um, assorted other you know, gaskets, seals, parts, pieces. You might ask, why do I hoard starting engine parts like I do? Well, first reason is I love them. Um, you know, you get these things tuned up where they got a good sharp, uh, ah, sorry, good sharp uh, mag, a good clean carb, good rings, good valves, no leakage in the cylinders, good vacuum, good compression. They're really a joy to have and to operate. Um, if I was boss of the world, everything would still have starting engines put on them, but I'm not. But um, second reason why I have all these parts is because starting engines are so often abused and i have this one right here that's a worst case scenario it's from old 5j 2115 i know i bust on that cat a lot but this was my first run in with a starting engine that had had a catastrophic failure now keep in mind these little starting engines only hold about one quart of oil in the crankcase and they're a splash lube system and they run at 3000 rpm so <laughs> you don't really have any leeway to play with with these things you have to take care of them if they're going to last if you can expect a good service life out of them and like i said under the best of situations they were roughly designed for a 250 service uh 250 hour service life anyway so and you know they have carburetors on them that are debris traps um passages clog they start to run lean and then they start to uh be difficult to get started um, you'll see a lot of people will run them on half choke, third choke, almost full choke because they're running lean and that's the only way they can get the fuel mixture right for them to run. Um, then they usually really only want to run at full throttle. They'll start these things up, cold engine, wrap it to full throttle, immediately put it right to work and before it even really has a chance to warm up, they shut it down as soon as the diesel engine starts. And you just can't run these things that way. So you're pretty well assured that when you get into an old cat, you're gonna have starting engine problems because they kind of have everything going against them. Now, the reason why this one blew up the way it did was because the guy that had had my grandpa's cat before me, the guy I bought it from, had lent that D2 out to somebody to use. He told them, make sure you always cut off the starting engine by turning the gas off and letting the carburetor burn itself out. Don't use the mag switch to shut it off. You need to have that gas turned off because these have those little Zenith downdraft carburetors on them. And if you don't shut the fuel off, you know, crawler tractors shake and, and vibrate and bang around and you will have leakage that goes past that inlet needle. It's gonna run down the throat of that carburetor and it's gonna find its way down in the crankcase and thin out the engine oil. And that's exactly what happened here. The guy he lent it to did not shut the fuel off to uh, kill the starting engine. He just was using the mag switch, left the fuel on all the time. It diluted the crankcase and blew it up pretty big. So here's what came out of it. First, we'll just look at this back crank bearing. It goes on the journal right there. You can see that wore very loose and it even spun in the block and just, I mean, it hogged itself out bad. It got the crankshaft running so loose that this crank throw was starting to come around and hit the piston skirt from that cylinder which kind of beat that up broke the oil control ring kind of mangled that um, it also took out the rod bearing on this one so you can see that's all that's left of the connecting rod that thing got quite bent up and twisted mangled it completely knocked the back of the skirt off of this piston um the oil control ring was in the crankcase in pieces the rest of the piston skirt was in pieces that's about all that's left of the back end of it it actually slung this one out hard enough you can see the witness marks that it smacked uh, the piston top flat out against the cylinder head at one point and when this thing when the rod finally let go from the crankshaft you can see most of the bottom end of it is gone um we have this mark right here which corresponds with this notch that was knocked out of the cylinder wall there. That's where this rod finally came to rest. And the crankshaft came around and basically pounded in on the top of it. The witness marks here are what created uh, this big uh, gouge right here when that crankshaft finally came around and pow, ended up at rest on top of this rod, sandwiching it between the crank and that busted out portion of the cylinder. So. 
that's pretty much par for the course when you let the crankcases on these things get diluted with gasoline. That oil gets thin and things do not lubricate. And like I said, this is winging around at 3,000 RPM and they just can't handle that. So many of these engines have been destroyed by not shutting the fuel off to the carburetor and letting that run dry. I mean, the mag switch is pretty much only used for emergency situations or, yeah, if you're going to shut it off, perform an adjustment real quick, and then turn it right back on and start it, that's fine. Use the mag switch. But if you're just going to be uh, operating the machine for a while, just run that thing out of gas. It's going to save you so many problems. So hopefully that explains why I hoard starting engines the way I do because, you know, they're so often abused and you're going to find problems with them. These parts are getting harder and harder to find. So if I can find a decent unit, even like that old uh, car that's on the bench there with a quarter inch crankshaft end play, I'll snatch it up if I can get it reasonable and uh, tear it down. And if there's any good parts and pieces, I save them. Like I said, that's your store nowadays. It's getting so hard to find this stuff. You can't just go down to the cat dealer and buy all this. Some new old stock parts can still be found, but to a large extent, you're you're working off of your uh, used parts inventory that you keep on hand, kind of building your own store. That's what I do with it. So, and you know, like I said, I love starting engines. I love being able to crank the diesel for as long as it takes, preheat everything, pre-lube everything. They were kind of engineered to be the sacrificial lamb or the you know of the system where it all the cold start abuse you know, is, is absorbed by the starting engine. It bears the brunt of all that and it just protects the diesel and gets it so you can get that thing up to temp, lubed up, put the fuel to it, it takes off, it runs, and you're basically starting off with a warm engine. Um, it, it saves the components where they count in that, in that expensive complex diesel engine. So hopefully, well, I shouldn't say hopefully, I'm pretty confident I have enough parts here to get at least one starting engine put together and running. Um, I might do two or three if I find that I have that many good parts and I can put the puzzle pieces together in the right way where everything's good and just kind of get kind of some spares on hand too. That's kind of why I've been accumulating all these parts and pieces for these. But yeah, you're, you're guaranteed to find problems in them because most of the people that cuss starting engines, I don't think I've ever had one that's really been running right, that's really been proper. Because when you get them really tuned up and everything's top notch, I mean, they'll start with one pull, they'll idle right down. You can hear the cylinders go pop, 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 pop. I mean, one at a time, Pull them to wide open throttle they got plenty of power and they just do what they need to do but they have to be right to do it so we're going to get into an extensive rebuild for 1113 hope i didn't talk too much for you guys thanks for watching please tune in again